All right, it is noon on the nose. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome again to Mercer University's Professional Development Series. My name is Myron Randall. I'm the Associate Director of Recruitment and Community Engagement here at Mercer University. Uh, and I am your host for this series today. I am looking forward to our topic and learning a little bit more about our topic today. I've got with me one of my dear friends, uh, one of our professors of management here at Mercer University at the Stetson Hatcher School of Business, Dr. Laura Morrow. Uh, and before we get into the topic, I've got to ask, Laura, how long have you been at Mercer and how did you get to Mercer? All right. Well, I started at Mercer in the fall of 2017. And I moved to Mercer as I was um, is making life change. And so my first couple of years as a, as a um, married, I, I worked in Nashville and lived here in Atlanta and eventually found my place here at Mercer in the fall of 2017. Well, we are certainly glad, and you have certainly enriched the Mercer community. Uh, now, one more question before we uh, hand over the controls to you and we talk about how to lead effectively. Uh, tell us how you got into the area of research that you're going to talk about today. I know you do a lot of research on stress management, employee engagement. Tell us a little bit about how you got there. Sure. Um, and I'm going to answer that question, but in probably a little bit different way. So I um, finished up my dissertation or my PhD program um, in 2010 from the University of Mississippi and ended up um, writing a dissertation in workplace stress. And, uh, you know, stress was always something that was of interest to me, um, you know, as a normal person. <laughs> He was balancing a lot. Um, stress was something that was just um, prevalent in my life and in people's lives that I knew. And I realized it to be a very interesting phenomenon, but, but being able to study it was a very important phenomenon. But what I wanna, what has made it more interesting to me as of late is I'm actually a stage three cancer survivor. So in two weeks, I will have reached the 10 and a half months of no evidence of disease. And so I think my passion for um, stress management and research in the stress area has actually um, only recently taken a, a, new, um, a new turn. Um, I've gotten a, rev a revised passion for it, if you will, um, because of my experience uh, fighting cancer. So I used a lot of this, what we're gonna talk about today in my own journey, um, fighting for my life. Well, so first off, congratulations on being cancer free. That is a wonderful thing. Uh, and we are glad you are cancer free because you're right back here at Mercer engaging with us and our students. Uh, so that is absolutely wonderful. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to hand the reins over to you and let you talk to us about how to lead effectively during a crisis. But before I do that, I do want to mention that you are welcoming questions uh, and would like to answer questions. So if you are watching us and you've got questions for Dr. Morrow, there is a question and answer button down at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type questions in throughout the entire presentation. We're going to stop in moments of the presentation and answer and address those questions. And then we'll finish those questions at the very very end. So without further ado, I have got my notebook ready and I am ready to learn from Dr. Laura Morrow on how to effectively lead through crisis. Thank you so much, Myron. I really appreciate that kind introduction. As we start, I'm going to tell you, we, we, the title of this presentation is How to Lead Effectively Through Crisis. And we will talk about leadership, but I think what you're going to experience today is we're going to talk about leadership from a backdoor approach. And we're going to spend the majority of this conversation really about stress. Um, so some of our goals today is understanding the stress process in your own life learning where in that process coping mechanisms can be effectively utilized, explore some coping mechanisms, and then how to minimize experiences of stress on your team by the way you lead. And so as we talk, as, as we talk today, um, you, you will notice that I'm not going to mention the word leadership very much at all, but I think that what we do talk about and what we do walk through today um, the idea of leadership is, is prevalent through it all um, because how we do manage our stress, I think, um, drastically impacts our ability to be a successful leader. Um, interestingly enough, it may also impact if you're not currently a, a leader in a formal role in your organization, it may impact your ability to rise up as a leader 
if you are handling crisis, handling stress well in your organization. So either way, um, any, either place you find yourself today, um, I think this webinar will be, will be insightful and useful to you as we walk through the stress process um, from as a goal to sort of a backdoor into effective leadership. So I hope this will be beneficial to you today and trust that it will be. All right, so as we get into the stress process, we are all probably very familiar with stress, very familiar with the stress process, but you may not have taken, um, had the opportunity to take some time to really kind of break down the pieces of the stress process into smaller pieces. So traditionally, we have four pieces of the stress process. If you take the coping out, um, which, which we're going to for just a minute, and look at just what happens with stress, if we're not trying to cope with it, just what happens in the stress process, we have stressors, those things that we're exposed to that can then lead to stress or strain. Um, we strain here is what we are used to calling stress, but technically it's actually um, strain. And then burnout if we're if we have a continued exposure to that strain. So let's start off with some of the stressors. So my background is from a workplace perspective, looking at stressors as far as what I've researched, and um, and. And since this is a, a workplace webinar, we're going to stick with the workplace stressors. But as we look at this, I want you to think about all of the ones in this list that have been changed or impacted because of the pandemic of COVID-19. So things like work overload. Some of you are working now more than ever. Others of you are working less now than you have been, and so you have time to partake in things like these webinars. But work overload, role conflict, that is when you have two different pieces of your job that are in conflict with each other. So two different aspects of the role that don't necessarily play well together all the time. So conflict that come from that. Ambiguity, this is a big one. We don't like ambiguity. We don't necessarily all like um, not knowing. And so role ambiguity may be something that you're more likely to experience now than even before, but role ambiguity shows up on this list of workplace stressors. Resource inadequacy, not being able to get the resources that you need. Um, interpersonal conflict. So I have the, an asterisk by interpersonal conflict for a very important reason, and that is because um, research shows that interpersonal conflict is the number one workplace stressor as far as negative um, impact on stress in the, in the workplace. So with something like a global pandemic where everyone has more on their plate in some way or another, right? Um, we might be more likely to come to the workplace being more tired, more stressed out, more going on that we than we might normally so um, interpersonal conflict is a big one on any day especially and how whatever day you are in your safe at home routine or your quarantine um, lifestyle that you may or may not be in right now working conditions this is a big one you know we had life figured out we worked the way we knew to work best um, and then all of a sudden we're working from home and I was laughing a few minutes ago. I mean, literally at like 1158 when the um, trash guys were leaving, um, the trash company was leaving the street because I mean, here I am about to start and I'm not sure if this is going to be finished by the time we start this webinar. So working conditions have been um, impacted to say the least management style and job insecurity and obviously with furloughs with layoffs with um, reduced work hours that that some are experiencing all of these things are stressors on a normal day and may be more likely to be stressors during a pandemic so um, those are the stressors stressors once you're exposed to them um, lead to strain not for everybody and we'll talk about that a little bit some sometimes your your personality um, the way that you were born the way that you're made your experience past experiences with stressors and strain have um, impacted your ability um, to cope with those things but strain would be the second box in the stress process so once you start physically or psychologically or behaviorally experiencing strain 
And then finally, if we have a continued exposure to strain or to stress, um, we, that's when we start experiencing burnout. And so burnout has three primary uh, components. One is physical fatigue. So if you just feel more tired, I was in a um, Zoom meeting last night for an organization that I'm involved with um, um, in the community and the, the person who was running the meeting, um, we, we were on the meeting for a few minutes before everybody started and he said, I'm just tired. Being on Zoom every day, all day, it's amazing how just how tiring it is. And some of that is that physical fatigue that comes from having extended exposure to stressors, which has turned into some strain that now is starting to experience, um, it's starting to manifest itself in burnout. So physical fatigue, cognitive weariness. This is when those of you who are, who've been students in your past, which I would guess would be 100% of you, the cognitive weariness is when um, the best way to describe that is you've studied for a test, you're ready, you get in there and you look at the test and you're like, oh, I can't remember. All these answers all of a sudden look familiar. I can't remember. That's kind of that cognitive weariness. Sometimes I, I describe it as like being like a sludge on your brain, right? Just something in there that just slows down that cognitive processing or that cognitive ability of your brain. And emotional exhaustion, this is the third one. And the mechanism for emotional exhaustion is the same mechanism that if we're trying to eat healthy and we're trying to be healthy and we've done a great job until like 8.30 at night and then we walk over to the refrigerator with full, um, you know, we're planning to get a big bowl of spinach or a cup of water. And then all of a sudden we open the refrigerator and we see leftover dessert or mashed potatoes or something that's in there that looks yummy and we don't have the ability to turn it down anymore. And so we find ourselves at night having those late night snacks that aren't as healthy as we started off with earlier in the morning. Um, some of that is that emotional exhaustion. We don't have the capacity to like, hold in all of our, um, our self-control and things like that that we did earlier in the day. So the same thing happens with um, our ability to be nice, to be kind, to um, hold it in when we're frustrated with others, which we all sometimes are. Um, and so you've been able to hold it all together and say all the appropriate and nice things, but the more and more and more you're exposed to stressors, the harder and harder it is to not just yell at someone or to get really frustrated or to say something you don't mean or that filter that used to be right in your mouth starts getting a little further and further away. And so you realize that as soon as it's come out, like I shouldn't have said that. That's all sort of this emotional exhaustion from burnout. So I know I skipped over um, strain and the reason why, well, we talked about it being in three different categories, but let me show you a little bit di um, deeper into this stress. So some of the things that you may be experiencing now, so psychologically, things like anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, sleeplessness, frustration, family problems, burnout, a big part of burnout is psychological. Those are some of those strain pieces, um, behavioral type things. So any type of behavior that you're engaging in that isn't necessarily healthy for you, whether it's excessive smoking, um, substance abuse, alcohol, you know, there's a lot of memes right now of, of alcohol consumption and things like that, that people coming out of this, either we're either going to all have a, a lot more weight that we're carrying, or we might realize that we are, we are drinking more than we normally would or should. Um, being accident prone, something as simple as stubbing your toe. Um, I have, I have had, um, I've had a couple of little accidents of stubbing my toe. I think I've broken my toe in this pandemic because we're tired and you're just, you get up and you're not paying attention and you hit something and bonk heads or whatever it is. If those things are happening, that is totally normal with a stress process. Um, things like violence and even if it's not physical violence, but even emotional violence, workplace bullying, those kinds of things can show up as far as strain is concerned. And then the physiological things, which are the reasons why our doctors tell us to be careful about stress, um, that high blood pressure, the muscle tension, the headaches, um, any of those kinds of things, um, heart disease and even cancer can come from stress. 
So those are some of any of those lists. I've given you several lists either in this slide or the slide before. If you're experiencing those things in your life right now, chances are um, they're heightened because of the pandemic. So why can crisis cause stress or enhance our experiences of stress? Well, the, the easy answer to that is stress research really centers around two things. One is resources and two is control. So in moments where we don't have resources or moments where we're not in control, those are really the two things that trigger stress. And so you look at everything that's going on in your life right now, things are not in our control that we used to think were in our control, whether or not they were, it was perceived control or actual control, it doesn't really matter. We felt control. We had resources that were in place and some of those things have been shattered. And so because of those two reasons, we may be more likely to experience stress. So one of the, um, one of the, the key foundational pieces of stress research is, um, is a theory called conservation of resources. And with conservation of resources really describes what is it that, why we have stressors, what is it that causes stress? And one of the things, there are three things that, that this particular researcher, Hobful, suggests causes stress. One is a, a, a loss of resources. Two is a threat to a loss of resources. So it doesn't even ha have to be actual loss. It could just be the threat of loss causes um, stress. And then finally, a lack of resource gain following an investment of your resources. So if you're investing a lot and you don't feel like you're gaining anything from that, extra resources back from that, that is also stressful. So as you, I know everyone in this webinar is, a, is an extraordinarily smart person. And so it doesn't take much to realize, wow, there's, there's been threats to our resources these days. We're worried about jobs. We're worried about, um, about revenue. We're worried about clients. We're worried about customers. We're worried about relationships, how we're going to be able to deal with our employee. So there's a lot of threat to resources that are going on. There's a lot that's not in our control. And because of that, it's very likely that the stress and burnout that you are experiencing has been exacerbated from what you are used to experiencing on any given day. So Myron, I think this is a great time to stop for questions and let's see, let's see what folks may have for questions for me. Yeah, we do have some questions that are in the chat. Uh, the first one is, there are some people that seem to be immune to stress or they can carry a lot of stress. Uh, do they do some type of mental work? How do you become more resilient to stress? That's a great question. And so there was a couple of ways I would say we're going to, the next thing we're going to talk about is coping. And so some people have, um, that do really well with stress have figured out how to cope with stress well. And so have figured out their systems or their strategies in place for coping. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, but also, um, there is personality in your individual differences and dispositions that you were born with that have been cultivated throughout your life. Those also play a key role in our ability to um, be more um, resilient or, um, or um, be immune to stress in some way. So, and then there are other personality traits that make you more likely susceptible to stress. So things like if your um, high conscientiousness might experience more stress than those who are not high conscientiousness. So there's, there's some personality differences that can be helpful or can make the stress process just a little bit more challenging. I've got another question from someone here. Uh, okay. They want to know about those behavioral attributes that you start to act out after having stress and strain. Can some of those be positive? Uh, they're addicted to working out. Now, I know too much working out might be another problem, but sure. <laughs> they're addicted to working out. So can some of those be positive or appear to be positive? Sure, absolutely. And that's a great um, point as well. So there are some good things in the stress process. So there, there are two different types of stress. And what we've talked about today is, and what we're talking about in this particular webinar, is this negative stress idea of distress 
But there's also a flip side to that coin that sometimes stress can be positive. And that is called use stress. And those are the things like sometimes having a little bit of time pressure helps you to make, um, to finish a project or helps you to in, enhance your performance because you have a tiny bit of pressure. Um, having a little bit of conflict, we talked about interpersonal conflict and it can be debilitating, but having a little bit of conflict, having somebody that plays devil's advocate when you're trying to make a decision, something like that, having a little bit of conflict can be a really positive thing because it, 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 has, um, it allows you to really look at your um, process and be able to think through things that you might not have thought through if you didn't have a little bit of conflict introduced. So yes, what you are saying, there can be some positive behaviors that come from this. Um, stress, um, knowing that if, man, if I can just get in the gym, that that really helps with my, with my stress. And so those, when they become positive, those behavioral things are positive, they actually become coping mechanisms. So, um, and so they're not really at that point manifestations of stress anymore, but they're, they've been incorporated in the coping mechanism process. But great questions. There are so many good questions. I'm going to save some of these for a little bit okay. later after the webinar, but so many good ones. Uh, okay. A lot of light bulb moments are happening for folks. So I'm cool. going to turn the reins back over to you and I'll save the rest of these questions for at the end. So back to you, Dr. Morrow. Okay. Well, so the good news is, is all the bad news is over, right? <laughs> so, so the fact that stress is hard and here are all the ways stress looks like, and you probably are likely experiencing a lot of stress, that part of the webinar is over. So now we're going to talk about what we can do to cope. So here I have the same um, picture here of the stress process. So you can really map out what's happening. And I have a star here for coping. So coping traditionally, theoretically takes place between the stressor and the strain. So we are exposed to stressors all the time. They don't always turn into strain. And so um, the coping mechanisms are the things that help them help us keep stressors from converting to, str um, to strain or experiences of stress. And so we're gonna talk about some of those coping mechanisms, but before I do, I want to let you know, one of my, I told you I did my, re um, my dissertation in workplace stress. And one of the things that I learned is I started thinking about, okay, if we're proactive about the stress process and we know we're likely to experience some things, can't we cope prior to the stressors happening? And the answer I found is yes, we actually can um, cope with stressors prior to stressors coming because we anticipate stressors, right? If we're even, if things that are even a threat can be a stressor, then we can also cope with things to be a stressor. And I think that is excellent news now. You know, we're gonna return to some type of normal, but it's not gonna be the normal that we've experienced the last however many years of your life you're, you've been alive, right? Our new normal is gonna be different. And so we can do things now that can actually help um, prevent stressors in the future, um, which is really exciting to me. And then also, you can also impl implement coping mechanisms after you've experienced that strain, after you've experienced that stress. Maybe you were looking at that list and you were kind of having a conviction moment of, oh, I've been doing some of these things or I've seen some of these things in my own life. You can stop that process in its tracks from turning into burnout by starting to implement the coping mechanisms here. And so I don't want people to be like, oh, I missed my chance. Coping only can happen before the stress. And that is not true as you might suspect. So coping can be at any of these places that these stars line up. The thing that I really wanna make sure everybody understands about coping is the importance of daily recovery from cope of coping daily recovery from the experiences of stress that you might be facing so i will tell you when um there there's several things that make a, a cancer journey similar to a pandemic safe at home shelter in place quarantine journey okay and one of it one of the things is you don't get a break 
So you, we don't really get a break from life in a pandemic, right? It's always there. Same with cancer. Once you know that those words are associated with your, with your life, you can't forget them. And I remember being in the, the hardest days of chemo thinking, if I could just have, if I could just have an hour where I forget cancer was part of my life experience, when I forget it was part of my reality, that would be like heaven. You know, it would be the greatest gift, the biggest wish, the biggest dream that I could possibly think of. And I've had moments in this pandemic where it felt the same way. So if there's something, and this is another reason why being in a pandemic, stress can be a little bit more complicated because it is harder to have daily recovery from it. However, if we can figure out a way to sort of get lost in our own little world every single day, even for a few minutes, that can drastically increase our ability to um, successfully cope with strain and burnout. The thing that really hit me in this next bullet is probably the biggest um, aha moment of my whole PhD program and really has been a game changer, a life changer in my own life, in my own personal experience with stressful things in crisis is the knowledge that the levels of experience stress will continue to increase unless recovery is introduced. And what that means is, if your stressors don't change, you're going about life, life is good all the time, stressors are not changing at all, okay? But you don't take time to recover from those everyday, normal, not increasing stressors, your strain and burnout will still increase, which is fascinating to me. So, in the only way to keep strain and burnout at bay is to daily walk away from it, right? So I, I remember thinking in my PhD program, I actually gained about 35 pounds. And I said, I don't have time to work out. I don't have time. I don't have time. And the reality is I didn't have time not to, right? Because once I, in the very last year, I started, I started walking and running again and taking care of myself. And, um, and what I learned when I would walk away, you know, in the book, the middle of that, um, the burden of extra work overload, right? When I would walk away and take a few minutes, take 30 minutes or an hour to myself, when I came back to it, I was able to be more productive. I was able to be more creative. I was able to, um, to resolve problems and solutions that I had been wrestling with and kind of were stuck in the mud about that I was not able to do prior to that. So this idea of coping, figuring out ways to cope daily, even if it's just a couple of minutes, um, is so important. And one of the things I want you to see, I've, at the bottom of this um, slide, if you go to the CDC's website and you just, or Google CDC coping COVID or coronavirus, um, or go to this link if you can screenshot it for a second, um, and, and go to that, the CDC has identified specific things that you can do to help cope with this pandemic. So um, the thing about coping, and I'm about to put a laundry list of some coping mechanisms up. The thing about coping is it's kind of like an art. What works for me may not work for Myron. What works for Myron may not work for me. And so, um, so between the list of what the CDC has provided and some examples that I'm about to, to highlight here, um, grab what works for you to put in your own toolbox of um, coping strategies. So we all have our favorite tools, right? We all have things that are our go-to tools. And having that toolbox filled with go-to coping strategies is super helpful because sometimes in some seasons, things work that they haven't worked before. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recover. I mean, I'm going to go through a couple of these. Number one, since we know that stress is related to control, start your day by doing something in control. And that's the reason why I have a bed and a made bed in this a picture in this um, on this slide. 
I was at a conference one time and I heard that if you don't make your bed in the morning, your bed will invite you back into it the rest of the day. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I will tell you, I started making my bed that day. And, and by doing something just at the very beginning of the morning that can kind of be like, I am in control of my space. Um, James Clear, who wrote the book Atomic Habits, talks about resetting the room after you leave a room. And so that making the bed in the morning is resetting your bedroom for the day. Um, anything that you can do like that to start your day in control um, is, is excellent. Being positive. Um, when I started my chemo journey, I was like, well, or cancer journey, I was like, there's two ways to go about this. You know, I can either be miserable or I can have a positive experience about this. And being positive might actually physiologically help. So I'm going to choose that one and it's a whole lot more fun. And so I actually dressed up um, to my chemo appointments in anti-cancer themes. And so um, anyway, that, that may be another webinar another day. But being positive absolutely makes a difference. And it's another individual difference that people have that those who are more, more likely to be optimistic or have positive affect, have that ability to experience positive things, um, it absolutely makes a difference. Identifying some trigger points. So there are things that you can do that you can, you can pick a song that if you start figuring out, oh my gosh, I am about to be, I'm really grumpy. And we all have those times. And if a snack didn't help, um, what is it that might help? Maybe a song helps. And so, you know, if you can just turn on that song and within seconds, it changes your attitude, figure out, identify what those trigger points are for you in your, um, in your life. Use the 10 minute rule. If there's something that you don't want to do, say, I'm just going to do it for 10 minutes. Because a lot of times getting started is the hardest part. So, you know, if we can get started, we stay engaged, right? And if we don't get started, we don't. But if I, I mean, we can all talk ourselves into doing something we don't want to do for 10 minutes. So that might be something. Uh, plan for distractions. There are going to be distractions, especially if you're working from home, especially if you have pets, especially if you have kids that are trying to help you. There will be distractions. So be kind to yourself. Be realistic about what you can accomplish in your day and what you can't. Reward yourself in the times where you can um, reward yourself. I will say that one of the things that I used to do that I no longer do is I had a legal pad of my to-do list items and I looked at it throughout the day. And there is nothing more overwhelming than looking at a legal pad with 57 things to do in a day. And so what I do now is I still may have a 57 list to do list of things that I need to do in different areas of my life, but I don't keep that in the front of my desk anymore. I have that tucked away. It's easy to find. It's easy to access when I get it, but I now make my to do list on a post it note because being able to be a little bit more realistic of what I can accomplish in a day is more post it note sized not legal pad sized. And just that little reminder is super helpful. And then when I finish my post-it note, I have a celebration, I get an extra piece of chocolate, I go on a walk, something, and then I come back and refill a new post-it with more things from that 57 um, list long legal pad sheet. And it's not staring me in the face, reminding me of, of what I'm not getting to right? And so all those things are kind of important. Prioritizing what's important. There's all kinds of work on there as far as time management, action priority matrices where you spend time on the urgent and important things over the non-urgent, non-important things. Um, others have come up with the idea of a big three, figuring out your big three every single week, allowing that to help you identify um, if it's not one of your big three, doesn't get your best work time right? Um, all those kinds of things. Make appointments. Um, make appointments with yourself in times that work for you. So you may be an early morning person. You may be, you may be not an early morning person, but your kids aren't either. So the only time your house is quiet is in the morning. Set appointments for your time. Turn off your email for those few minutes. To silence your phone get the things done in your appointments and then you can get to your email or get to your phone calls. 
um, set boundaries. There's a guy out of Nashville, Michael Hyatt. He's a leadership guru in Nashville, and he's written several books and is, um, has, a, has a planner um, series that he, product that he sells. And one of the things that he does to set boundaries and working from home, boundaries are hard right? Boundaries that we used to have good boundaries in place, they're gone now working from home because we're, we're in the middle of everything and we're bouncing back and forth throughout the day, perhaps between laundry and feeling like we need to clean the kitchen and preparing meals and um, taking care of kids all while we're trying to have a work day. Um, but one of the things that, that Michael Hyatt does is at the end of his day, he has a timer set up on his on his lamps so that his lights turn off about five minutes before he needs to transition to the to the home the home life or to exercising or whatever that is so figuring out what those boundaries are and keeping them um, I think for me, that's been the hardest thing about working from home. Um, I used to have a really good morning routine. I'm a 4.30 in the morning. I'm up at 4.30. I'm in the gym a lot of mornings by 5 o'clock. I come home. I have about 45 minutes of quiet time before anybody else wakes up. And now I'm sleeping a little bit later, which is good in my body needs. And I'm getting my, I'm getting my exercise later in the day once it gets light. But I'm realizing that I just go straight from bed to my desk, right? And I'm missing that normal time that I use for daily recovery to really set up my day. And so I've had to kind of refresh and reset myself and um, to move forward in the right direction. And then no matter what, whether your coping strategies are things that are on this list or things that you read from the CDC, or things that you have always done your whole life, recovering daily. Don't make sure that the first thing that comes off that to-do list, if something has to give, isn't that recovery time, because those experiences of strain and burnout are going to increase if we forego our daily recovery. And again, it doesn't have to be long. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, just time where you can just, um, just get out of your head time where you can just forget um sometimes for me that's running i i'm not honestly i'm not yesterday i ran my first mile since being a cancer survivor so yesterday i finally got back into my my running routine right um it may be reading it may be coloring it may be watching a movie it may just be um just going on a walk, cooking. We've made a lot of good food at the Mario house. I'm not going to lie. So <laughs> anything like that where you can just forget listening to music that you can forget, turn off the TV, turn off the news. Um, so you can engage in some daily recovery of, of some self-care is super important. Okay. So how in the world does this impact leading your team? As we talked about before, I think your knowledge of this um, and can be incredibly helpful in the way that you structure work for your team. Obviously, you can share some of these things. You can have team meetings where you check in with everybody and see how everybody's doing. You can offer suggestions of like, hey, here's some things that I wanted to share. Try them out if you can. Um, but I will tell you, there's two key things that I would say, if you're in a leadership position, that I would strongly encourage you to do for your team members, for those that are working for you and with you. And those are one, remember, this is all about control and resources. So where can you share control or resources? How can you provide for flexibility for the folks in their own schedules? Um, I will tell you right now, I would say um, that I'm, I'm teaching class, of course, and, and what I've done, there, there are things that we would have normally had class on Thursday nights, and we would have normally taken quizzes, had lecture, um, had class activities, all on Thursday nights. Well, you know what? Thursday nights might not work when the students aren't sitting in the classroom anymore. So Thursday nights, they have young kids. They're trying to do baths. They're trying to do dinner. Um, it's kind of the day where everybody's, um, that emotional exhaustion's kicked in and everybody's kind of like, ah, at the end of the day. And so what we've done is I've restructured our class time 
so that anything that required cognitive thought, quizzes, exams, lectures, are all in their own time when they can process it best. Whether that's three in the morning, 10 at night, noon, when they're in a space, a headspace to be able to consume or, or tackle cognitive tasks, that's when I've, when I've scheduled that. Um, the things that we do for class time, Thursday nights, we show up for class activities that are participation points. It allows for us to be able to check in. And so there's a little bit more flexibility in the schedule. So are there areas where you can share some control over the autonomy or the flexibility of the way your work is processed? There still needs to be accountability mechanisms. There are still goals that need to be met. But are there ways where you can share resources um, and share control that you might not have done before. And then finally, vulnerability, being real. This is impacting everybody. I was at Emory this week and everybody I interacted with, all the way from the people drawing my blood to the oncologist, it's hard. This is hard. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic status you're in, what race, where you live, um, what your job is. This is hard and it's hard differently for everybody. So how real can you be with your team um, about the realities of life in a pandemic? I think one of the worst things that we can do is pretend it's business as usual and go forth and not even acknowledge that life is incredibly different. I think that can be one of the most detrimental things that we can do for our, our businesses and for our teams is to pretend like it's not impacting us at all. Um, having those moments where we can check in and just how's everybody doing and I'm really struggling with this or I'm having a hard time or this is tough. Um, is really important. And, and if you don't believe me, the expert in this area is, is a researcher. Um, she's a social, um, a social work researcher out of the University of Texas, Austin, Brene Brown. And she's written books. She's a bestseller now. Um, but she, she, the first thing she did that really made a mark it, with her name in, in the work and vulnerability is um, a TED Talk that she did. So you can Google Brene Brown vulnerability TED Talk, and she talks about all the benefits of really being vulnerable with your team and um, has a book, or I think her, bet, her most recent bestseller is Dare to Lead, and it's all about being vulnerable as a leader. And so that's what, those were the two things that I would really suggest now that you understand more of the stress process, you understand the mechanisms that can help and hurt, um, you know, our experiences of stress and burnout, and you understand um, what you can do differently, I think um, that would be really, really helpful with leading your team. So Myron, I'm sure there are more questions at this point. What do you, what do you have for me? Uh, this has been just phenomenal. I've got pages of notes here. I hope y'all didn't see me looking away too much as I tried to write notes. If you would go back to the slide that talks about coping mechanisms, I think that would answer a lot of the questions that we have. This one, like one or the one? The, this one right here. One okay. person says that they always thought of the idea of coping with a negative connotation. Ooh, yes. But you have reframed that for them and let them know that it's really necessary and it's, it's, it can be positive. Absolutely. And, and whoever asked the question early on, you know, it seems like some people aren't affected by stress at all. Um, that's never true. You know, it seems that way. Our perception is that way. The folks that look like they don't ever deal with stress are the folks that are master copers. Mm, master right? copers. I like that. That yeah. is very good. Yeah. That's so good. coping Here's is a really good thing. That kind of leans into that, still talking about coping mechanisms. Okay. So this person says, you know, you talked about the individual nature of coping mechanisms, but how okay. can I help somebody cope? Or can somebody help me with a coping mechanism? And I think you gave us a few when you talked about leadership, but I think this is from more of a family orientation. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, so it's one of those things that it's a tough question because I think you can help somebody with some coping, but at the same time, um, if, if somebody, there's a lot of people who like, like to live in stress, right? There's a lot of people who really don't want to cope because they really like, they really like to be, you know, 
in the trauma of it. And, and that, that's, that's real as well. And so, um, so there are some things that you can do to help people cope, but at the same time, know that if somebody's not interested in getting help with coping, um, then, then it, they may not cope. Right. So, so just know that, um, I would say one of the biggest things, and this goes back to a leadership position, is giving per people permission to cope, giving people permission to take care of themselves. If you're somebody who you are a big believer that everybody should be able to leave or have a flexible schedule or whatever, but you don't, um, you don't allow folks to see that in your own life you're always at work and you're always staying late or whatever you can tell people all day long you can go home it's fine but your behavior you're sending the message that that's not what you expect and so i think sometimes helping people um, with coping is modeling coping behaviors right and when you know the people in your family or you know the people on your team and you've, you've gotten to know them, being able to model things or suggest things or, hey, let me do this with you, right? Um, so one of the things that I've been doing during this process is I love to draw. I'm not a great artist, but I love to draw, and so I doodle. And I was realizing that I was having a hard time with my um, coming up with creative ideas for my doodling, right? So I, I don't have kids at home. I have stepsons and they're older. And they're with their mom, but but I have three nephews, and my three nephews love to draw too. And so I know that my three nephews are probably having stress. One's an eighth grader missing out on all the eighth grade graduation and things. One's oh, a grader missing out on his last few months of elementary school. And so I reached out to those boys and I said, Hey guys, um, I'm having a hard time um, coming up with creative ideas. Can we set up like little drawing dates? And so every evening at the end of my work day, I do a drawing date with one of my nephews. And so we sit there and we chat and, you know, we, I draw, they draw, and then we're chatting about life and just engaging with somebody in coping um, can be really helpful as well. I like that idea, doing it together, coping together yes. as they see you cope then ultimately they'll get permission to cope. That is so Absolutely. good. Absolutely. That is Absolutely. so good. This has got to be our last question just to make sure that we are on time. This has, sure. again, been wonderful. I've had so many light bulb moments and aha moments that I wish I could go over. We'll go over it later on. I get to work with Laura, folks, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. But uh, this person says, it sounds like there would be a great benefit and increased investment in mental health check-ins at the workplace, at the school level, at the community level. Uh, and this is a big picture question. Are there any thoughts on how we can leverage this situation to influence positive changes in societal culture as it relates to stress recovery and mental health? How do I convince my boss that this is something that's valuable to do in the workplace? I know, which is right in where your work intersects. Oh, yes. This is, this is why I have um, job security as a researcher in this area. <laughs> and it only became increasingly more important. Absolutely. I, I think this is, you know, one of the questions that I keep asking myself that I have posted up in my office is, what do you want your new normal to be? Mm. And so we are in an amazing opportunity in life, a moment in life where we get to design what this new normal looks like. Um, and so, so I think this is a, a um, pivotal moment in, in industry. I think it's a pivotal moment in the workplace where we, do, we can start um, considering this. One of my areas that I'm really interested in is mental health and physical health for productivity and creativity and things like that. There is a strong connection between all of that and how, how work happens. Um, and so I think opportunities, the research is there. Um, there the connection points to research is not, they're not, um, you have to draw, you have to make some inferences. Um, but research is there. I am more than happy to, to ask some questions or answer some questions. And so questions, if, you, if you've asked the question, if you were the person who asked this question, go ahead and send Myron your email address or Myron, make sure we get that information. And I can follow up with um, some articles and things that could be initial evidence to share with your employer. 
Um, but if you are somebody who is in the um, decision making authority and ability in your company, and this is something that's intriguing to you, there, there are, and again, it's as individual as choosing a coping mechanism for what will work in your culture. But I think, um, I think there are so many opportunities and ways to explore this, and I already have ideas that will go way past the time. So I want to be respectful of the time. Hope that helped answered a little bit. Oh, I, I'm sure that did. And and folks. Laura is available, Dr. Morrow is available, I am available. If you've got additional questions and like to talk a little bit more about this particular topic, uh, but Dr. Morrow, I can't tell you enough how wonderful this webinar has been. And, and folks are in the question and answer bo box saying, thank you, this is a great webinar, I've learned so much. Uh, thank you for sharing your time with us and sharing this information with us. Uh, it has been revolutionary and absolutely wonderful. Folks, thank you for joining us on Mercer University's Professional Development Series. Stay tuned. We've got other really exciting webinars coming up uh, with the faculty and the experts here at Mercer University that we want you to share in and be a part of. I hope you've enjoyed this today, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Good evening, and thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you. Thank you, everyone.